Hello Brian, how lovely to see you again. Yes, hello Beryl. <laughs> well, this is very exciting, your new book. Would you just like to tell the viewers what it's called? It's called The Meaning and Purpose of Life, uh, The Big Jigsaw Puzzle. And how did you come by that title? Because life is a series of jigsaw pieces. If we look at life as isolated incidents, like the death of a loved one, a child, husband, wife, father, mother, tragedies in life, war, hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, murder. If we look at all those as isolated incidents, then life doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. But if we look at them as a whole and build up a comprehensive picture, then it does begin to make sense. So hence, they, each one is a piece of the jigsaw. And that's often the way, isn't it? We, an event happens to us and we can't see the big picture. That's what you're really saying, isn't it? Until maybe a little bit of time has passed and we see that big picture then. Precisely. A tragic event happens to somebody and they say, why is this happening to me? Or why has this happened to us? We didn't deserve this to happen. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at the bigger picture. Why do these things happen? Is there a reason? It, do we live in a law-governed universe or are we just a freak accident of nature living on a tiny ball of rock hurtling through space to be hit by some ginormous asteroid? <laughs> well, I suspect that you don't believe that we are uh, a freak of nature. I, I know that you believe that we're, we're much more. And I want to ask you, I'm curious, Brian, was there a defining moment in your life because I know you were going on along happily as an engineer, a husband, father, everything was just going along re really neatly. Was there a defining moment that woke you up to the fact that we are not just this body, that we're more and we're powerful beyond our, our imagination? There was. There was a very big defining uh, moment in my life in uh, Easter 1973. Mm -hmm. My parents had just retired and my mother had received healing for an arthritic hip uh, when they were in business and she wanted to continue with the healing uh, when they retired. Well, just around the corner from where they were living at the time was a spiritualist venue mm -hmm. and they asked me if I would like to go along one evening, Easter Sunday, uh, to the service that was being conducted there and cut a long story short, the medium uh, was a very good looking gentleman, very well dressed, from Peterborough mm -hmm. and uh, he gave me a rather startling message about my grandmother and uh, I'd never seen a medium before, I, I didn't know what they did, uh, no idea so I was rather startled when he said uh, I have your grandmother here so I said which one and straight away he said your mother's mother and he gave a perfect description of my grand he said she's about 90 odd years of age, she's five foot nothing in height, she's bent double uh, like this, he said, I, th I think it could be uh, osteoporosis, he said, and she's got bright red rosy cheeks, it looks like rouge to me, and he said, and she's got greying hair. Well, my gran had a remarkable head of hair with just a little bit of grey, but it was quite dark, it's going grey for 92. So. I was shocked that a man that I'd never met before could give me such an accurate description of my gran. And that was a convincer for you that there was something more going on in this world? It made me think, let me put it that way, and particularly when he said that she is saying to you, my lad, that you are only half alive, my lad, and that you ought to start looking at life in a different way, my lad. Well, that might not mean anything to anybody else, but to me, that was another shock because my gran always referred to me as my lad. Never Brian, it was always my lad. And she always used to say, come here my lad, it's time for some lunch. Or leave the cat alone when I was young, my lad. Or later, would you like a drop of pork, my lad. You know, it was always my lad. And that, and, and that changed my thinking about life. And that took you into studying the mediumship. I studied mediums, I went regularly to various spiritualist venues because I was really intrigued. If that man was really seeing my gran, who had passed away a decade before, mm -hmm. then that means that she was alive somewhere in another dimension. So, and as an engineer, that fascinated me. 
Right, so let's come into that then, this engineering brain, which is, you know, an engineer is very left brain, and mediumship is very right brain. So there must have been a little bit of a something going on there. How did you make that bridge? I investigated because I was curious. And since I can always remember coming into engineering, I wanted to know how things work. And I would like to know how machinery worked. Cars, aeroplanes, anything mechanical. I wanted to know how it worked. Now to me, if this man was really seeing my gran, her personality as I knew her, then that means that there must be a reason, a mechanical reason, why he is seeing her. Just like television frequencies, radio frequencies, then my gran must be living somewhere on a different frequency but can still communicate. And that was my line of thinking. So science is, was starting to really tell you something there, wasn't it? Your, 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 your left brain background, your left brain thinking was helping you to make sense of this really new and quite bizarre experience for you. It was, and uh, I went for many months studying mediums at the different spiritualist venues. Uh, some were mediocre and some were very good with accurate descriptions. And I always made a point of talking to them afterwards and asking them questions. And one particular medium uh, pointed to me and said, uh, you have healing ability, I can see blue in your aura as well as giving me an excellent description of my grandfather, complete with uh, cheese cutter cap, moustache. And uh, I said, well, I've been told many times that I have got the healing ability, but I, I don't know anything about it or what to do. So he said, come and see me afterwards. Well, I did, and uh, he invited me to his meditation group uh, in Chesham, which was another coincidence because I was 20 miles away from Chesham at Hitchin at the time. Mm -hmm. So he said, is that too far for you to travel? I said, no, I live in Chesham. So it was about a mile from where his sanctuary was. So I went to the sanctuary and learned meditation. And one of those times I was meditating and floated out of my body. Found myself looking at myself about 10 or 12 feet away except I didn't realise why I was standing up looking at the group when everybody else was sitting meditating. So I felt I had, I was solid, I could think, I could reason, I had memory, and here I was looking at everybody meditating and I was standing up at the back of the room. And suddenly I looked at the back of the head of somebody sitting in the chair in front of me and I realised it was me. I was looking at the back of my own head and the moment I did that I shot back into my body quickly. So how did you make sense of that kind of experience Brian? I asked the meditation teacher what had happened, I explained what had happened and he said congratulations you have just proved uh, that human consciousness can exist outside of the physical body. So I said what does that mean and he said you've just had an astral projection. Your astral body has come out of alignment to your physical, hence you could see your physical body sitting in the chair. So a whole new world... A whole new world... ...was opening up. It was. Was that scary? No, I was inquisitive. I was an engineer, for goodness sake. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I got all the books I could read on astral projection, and I read some really good ones. So I, I got jammed up on the astral body, why we had one, and... Uh, it was the link between the physical world and the afterlife. Mm -hmm. It's the mm -hmm. astral body that goes into the astral planes or other frequencies after, we, after this body of flesh dies. Big clue. And it's interesting, isn't it, about this consciousness? How would you describe consciousness? Because that's quite a, a biggie for, for many people. Mm. Yes, consciousness is the act of being. It is the act of memory, it is the act of perceiving. Uh, plants have consciousness and lie detector tests have proved that they, they have memory. Every living thing that we know from a flea to a fly to an elephant to a human to a tree to a uh, grass, 
it has memory and been proven in scientific laboratories that the lower species have excellent memories <coughs> and uh, elephants and uh, marine mammals have excellent memories just as we do and uh, that is the means of, of uh, communicating and surviving in a very harsh world is, is memory and focusing and when that consciousness leaves that being, that spark that, that is within us leaves the, the physical form be it a tree, a flea, a fly, a rat or a human then death of the physical form takes place what we call death but the life force that animates that physical form still survives. So, I'm going to ask you about then death and should people fear death? That is the object of my book, that to take away the fear of death and dying. In fact, one of the chapters is called precisely that, Death and Dying, Why the Fear? And many people have had near-death experiences and out-of-the-body experiences mm -hmm just the same as I had an out-of-the-body experience. And they can see their physical body lying on the bed or sitting in a chair asleep. And uh, they realise that consciousness does exist outside of their physical body. They are still alive in, in a different form, mm -hmm. in a different body. So that should take away the fear of, of dying, as near-death experience survivors uh, will affirm. They no longer fear dying. In fact, they look forward to it when their time comes. So what would you say on the topic then of reincarnation? The fact that, that uh, we may have more than one life. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes sense. Uh, that was another piece of the jigsaw that I investigated. Uh, I didn't have a problem with coming back to this planet or any other planet in a physical form because if we can incarnate once as we are now I didn't see a problem with incarnating hundreds of times it's the life force within the physical form that would reincarnate or have a rebirth and when we analyze it what does what does the average person learn in one lifetime from from cradle to grave what do they learn about life and what what would one think about a child dying at the age of five or six, for example? What would, what would that have learnt in that brief lifetime? Mm -hmm. Or what would be the sense in it? What, and what's your answer to that? Well, if we had more than one life, that means we come back time, time after time after time, perhaps in male form, female form, learning different lessons. And do we come back with a purpose, would you say? Uh, we come back with a very big purpose, as I explained in the book that life has a meaning and purpose and the purpose of life as is evident to the vast majority of people uh, is to understand love because love is the most powerful force in the universe. Okay, so and what would you say when people are looking for meaning and purpose in their life? Would you say to the people, because very, very often people are existing rather than living because they have no meaning and purpose in their lives and they don't understand that love is an energy, it's a frequency and they think love is like that in love stuff rather than that heart-centred love that we can, we can emanate all the time. Love is a very fickle emotion. Uh, we love we love food, we love cars, we love holidays, we love having a comfortable life mm -hmm. and we fall in love and fall out of love and we fall in lust and out of lust uh, but there is only one definition of love the facet of the diamond if you like uh, is unconditional love mm -hmm. we love someone, some, some animal unconditionally because we don't, it doesn't have strings attached. I love you because you are you, right. not because what you are doing, but what you are. It, and I would love you unconditionally. And the unconditional love, as I found out after years of research, is the law of the universe. We live in a universe of peace and harmony. And when that harmony is, is uh, in imbalance, then we get negative factors uh, coming to our lives. 
Okay, so are we now talking about good and evil? We are talking about good and evil because everything in life must have opposites. Mm -hmm. Hot, cold, good, bad, high, low, uh, to balance. And uh, evil, or what I call ignorance, is necessary uh, for us to appreciate good. And it is intertwined as a cosmic force it, within uh, the earthly spheres so that we can get a balance between uh, what is right and what is wrong. But the law of the universe being love, light, peace, harmony um, is always in control and, and evil or what we call uh, the negative forces um, will never be dominant. We can see that love heals, kindness, compassion heals. Anger, violence, jealousy, greed destroys. So pure observation tells us that love is the, the uh, law that we must live by. And you've had some many interesting experiences of the power of love in healing, haven't you? I have. Would you like to share some of those stories? Yes. Um, I was taught not just Raja Yoga meditation, but uh, I was taught at a healing sanctuary how to do the laying on of hands. Um, because I was told that the uh, requisites for being a good healer are integrity. You must be kind, loving, humble and compassionate. And anybody who has those attributes can, is a healer. And they attract the positive energies of the universe, as we know, the, the uh, yin-yang, as uh, the, the Chinese have called it for, for centuries the positive and the negative forces, and we channel the positive forces of love, peace and harmony through our bodies into that of someone or an animal that is out of harmony. So they have disharmony rather than harmony. And the energies that flow from healing hands, which have been photographed in, with Curlian photography, mm. uh, the energies coming from, an, from a healer's fingers and hands, um, energize the uh, what they call the, the energy system or the chakras in the human body to revitalize the immune system that heals the body. It's really quite simple once we begin to understand it, how healing works, why healing works, and who are capable of um, channeling these energies. This is fascinating, Brian. I want to move on because I know it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting topic right now as we're in 2012 and things are moving on and energies are changing and religion isn't what it used to be. Religion seems to be losing a lot of its supporters and I wonder if you could just tell us why you think that is happening, what's changing and how some people talk about God but not within the context of, of religion. Would you like to talk about that, that topic? Yes, religion is um, a subject that I have put into my book. It has a chapter in its own right. And I have looked at uh, several of the major religions in depth and took from them what I found to be helpful and uh, moved on. But religion, uh, what organised um, man-made religion, is um, losing. Uh, people are losing interest in that and uh, because it doesn't the majority don't answer the questions that people, deep thinkers today, are asking about life. Mm -hmm. Why are these things happening? Is there a life after death? If so, what is it like? Where do we go? Um, where does evil fit in to a universe uh, where we are told that a God of love uh, exists? Why, why does this God allow evil to take place? Why are 35,000 children dying every day through poverty, neglect and disease if there is a God of love? Well, the, re the religion have no sensible answer to that as people are finding. When they lose a loved one, they ask, where is my loved? Is my loved one still alive? Mm. And being told that they are in heaven with God uh, doesn't satisfy a lot of deep thinkers. They want to know, want to know more. Hence, they question. So, it's you see, organised religion relies on faith and belief, where there is no evidence 
of God where there is no evidence of an afterlife, they are told to believe and have faith. I've never subscribe to those two words, faith and belief, because I think if the answers are there, then we should seek for them. The Bible says, seek and you will find. Well, if we don't seek, we don't find. Well, to seek for something, you ask questions. And it is my philosophy that I never stop asking questions. Why, what, where, how, when? And if, if I don't get the answers, I move on and do research. But I have been blessed in life by having many personal experiences which have gone into the book, which have taught me more than a thousand books could ever have done. So, it's, all this is absolutely fascinating and I know you go into these topics in great depth in your book. So Brian, I want to ask you now about the power of thought. There's a lot of talk around about positive thinking. Can you tell us why positive thinking is so important for us. Yes, our thoughts govern our life. As a person thinks, so they are. And what we give out, we get back. The Buddhist philosophy has a wonderful word um, for, for what happens in our lives and it's called karma. Mm -hmm. uh, the Christian church calls it the sowing and reaping. Mm -hmm. What we sow, we reap. What we give out, we get back. Chickens coming home to roost, poetic justice, the boomerang law, uh, all say the same thing, that our thoughts govern our life. If we think positive, we construct positive things. The universe is impersonal. This force that we call God, uh, the infinite, the absolute, uh, is an impersonal force. It is pure and absolute love that sustains the universe on vibrations of love. It is pulsing love waves throughout the whole of the universe to keep the universe in harmony. And it is up to us to understand this force and search uh, for what this force is. And I so badly wanted to know if there was a God and what this force that people call God, Allah, the absolute the infinite is, that I was very blessed in having what people call a cosmic consciousness experience where uh, I became at one with the universe. Uh, my body, I, Brian Sadler, didn't exist at that moment. And I understood the complete meaning and purpose to life in an instant, hence the title of the book. It was like an all-knowing. I knew everything there was to know. The whole of the universe is one beautiful plan. And it, um, it is still expanding. The universe um, is a living, breathing organism. Everything is alive. People are living in other dimensions that we can't see with our naked eye. Uh, there are millions and millions of multidimensional um, frequencies that uh, scientists are now beginning to understand. Uh, and they understand 10, 11, 12 or more dimensions. And they, they also know that there are people living in there. And some of those people are the ones, our deceased relatives, friends, loved ones, living in another dimension. But thought is so very important because it can, it, it rules our life as we think. Um, we are changing our life from moment to moment. So there's a, there's a phrase that, that goes, you get more of what you focus on. Yes, and you can attract to you that which you think. Because the universe, as I said, is impersonal. And it will give us exactly what we are thinking or praying. Okay, so if you would talk about, about the law of manifestation and that we, we are incredible creators, we, are, we, we can create our own reality. Yes. And is this how you're saying that it works? We put out a certain frequency with our thoughts. Yes, all the great spiritual teachers um, uh, state this fact that we manifest in our lives that according to our thinking. 
And that's why, as I have said in the book, that the pessimist is always right because they're always getting things come into their life mm -hmm. um, to cause them to moan and whinge mm -hmm. and complain. Mm -hmm. And the optimist is always right because mm -hmm. they're always getting things coming into their life mm -hmm. that they are pleased with and, and are focused on. Mm -hmm. And both can say, I told you so. Mm -hmm. But it's merely the universe reacting to their thoughts. Okay, so what I hear then is you had a, a questioning mind. And because you were constantly asking questions, why, what, how is this all, all happening? The answers came to you. They did, because I really wanted to know. Mm. I had this great desire mm. to know if there was an afterlife, and if there was, what what is it? Mm. And I, having proved to myself with 15 years of seeing people in the afterlife, I, I was a medium for 15 years working, working the circuits, traveling thousands of miles over, the, over that period of time. And uh, I didn't need proof I had the proof myself and uh, I really wanted to know following that if there was a God and it domi it did dominate my life and uh, I really wanted to know if God existed what was God and then I had my cosmic consciousness experience which t told me uh, the very nature of what people call God the life force of the universe okay I just want to come in there this is absolutely fascinating. This cosmic moment that you had when you realised that everything was one and you, you are consciousness, we are, each of us is consciousness. Does that take away fear? Do you ever have fear in your life? Does that, have that experience take away fear? Exactly. I have no fear. Um, if I had a fear, I'm not too fond of heights. Um, but uh, the fear of life, no. Um, people are frightened uh, when they hear the news or read negative things in the newspapers and murders and violence and war. They, they, they fear for their uh, safety, they, they fear losing their jobs, uh, they fear getting old, uh, they, f they fear uh, poverty. Their lives are governed by fear. So you have a completely different perspective on life. I do. Don't you? I do. So it's 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 not like you're looking at it in the in the micro. You've zoomed out big time. Precisely. And, and you now see the big picture, the full jigsaw puzzle. I do. I when when I had that experience, I was shown the complete picture. Although the universe is still evolving and the picture is still evolving. But I was shown enough to understand that the universe is the most magnificent plan. I was shown the blueprint of how the universe is evolving. And it was many years later when I was shown Indian yogic uh, philosophy and I read Tibetan philosophy, did I understand what, that took, what cosmic consciousness experiences are. And thousands of people over the years have had these experiences and it it was by good fortune that I came across books on the subject and met other people who'd had these cosmic consciousness experiences. And everything that I had experienced was verified by these other people who'd had the same experience, which is very comforting. And uh, so, no, I don't, I don't fear in anything life because I see life as the big picture. And one thing it has taught me is that the average person is so governed by trivia in their life, they never stop to question what is it all about. They are so get involved in materialism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, with today's gadgets and gizmos, mm -hmm. and they think that owning property and objects uh, brings them happiness. But uh, as we know, it doesn't bring lasting happiness. And uh, the only true and lasting happiness is understanding how the laws of the universe work and understanding that love is the most important fact in life. 